every animal on the planet is amazing, and these guys are no different. I think we're all raised to believe that a sheep is pretty dumb and doesn't really have anything important to their life. The most amazing thing, of course, that people find is the very, very distinct personality changes between them. And I think so that's, that's what shocks people, because we don't often think of, especially farm animals, as having personalities or even having things that they like to do. I think what a lot of people don't understand is that when animals are used for animal agriculture, they really don't have anywhere near a normal life. Here, of course, we make sure that none of that happens. Over the seven years that we've been operating, over 120 animals have actually come through our doors and have been uh, rescued and rehabilitated here. The 20 years I was vegetarian, I always felt that the animal industry had nothing to do with me. So I never looked into how it worked because I felt that it wasn't relevant. Of course, once I started looking into it, then I realized that even on a vegetarian diet, it's actually very relevant to you because the horrors of uh, the death in the dairy industry and the pain and misery that the hens go through in order to lay eggs. I think when you come to these realizations, the first thing that you think is, I need to tell everybody else because obviously everybody else doesn't know. What happens in industry is they take babies away from mothers, they take friends away from friends. They break up everything that's important to these animals. This is winter lambing in Australia. If they give birth in winter, which they're bred to do, which is completely unnatural, of course natural would be being born in spring, just one after the other and I'm just so sad that we weren't able to get to them in time so you can see it in real time just how many that we're talking about here so bear with me guys because there's more it's just heartbreaking In 2007, there was a cow named Maxine who had been taken to a live market in New York. Maxine had uh, then escaped from that live market and was running through the streets of Manhattan being chased by TV helicopters. But she was eventually captured and taken to animal care and control. They'd struck up an arrangement with Farm Sanctuary to take her back to Sanctuary and give her a life there. This was an animal that was running for their life away from being slaughtered. And it just shows the power of how people's perception of these animals change when they actually meet them. I saw Maxine's story on a video and I thought that was very impressive. I was living in Florida at the time. I decided to start fundraising on behalf of Farm Sanctuary, which is of course based in New York. I did that for a while and ultimately decided I should probably go and visit the farm. And I just became very impressed by the educational component of the way that they ran the operation there. And I felt that it was something very powerful that we could bring to Australia. So that's why we set up Farm Animal Rescue here in Queensland. I met Brad King in 2011 when he told me about his plans for starting at Farm Animal Sanctuary in Brisbane. I was just so excited because there was nothing like that in Brisbane at the time. A lot of people want to start animal sanctuaries, but when I met Brad and he told me about his plans, I could see the commitment was there and that he really thought it through and knew what it entailed. I couldn't resist, I just had to be a part of it. Some people get into sanctuaries thinking it's going to be all about patting animals and spending time with them. But the reality is that you've got lots of different departments and divisions to think about. It's a lot like running a hotel. In the morning, everybody has to be got up and given their breakfast. Then of course, all of their rooms are cleaned. Then they're fed lunch and their dinner. And then of course, in the afternoon, there's the preparation of the bedding and then there's actually putting them all to bed. It's all about that sort of daily cycle of making sure the animals are all fed, looked after in a clean environment and healthy. I think the hardest thing about keeping far up and running is fundraising. It's so hard to constantly be having to meet budget, not only for the animals that are already here, but also to keep growing so that we can rescue more animals. So it's, it's a constant battle. Our budgets are around $20,000 a month. If you're not bringing in money, then you can't do anything. 
And of course, once you have animals on property, it's very important that you can ensure the continuity of that funding coming through. So that's a very critical part of it. If you don't grow, then of course, you never get to be able to buy the really important facilities that you need to have. Of course, we're always fixing fences. There's animals to be fed all the time. There's health care that needs to be considered. So in order to maintain the farm, we have a number of different funding programs. We have animal sponsorship where people can sponsor an individual animal. And we have supporters club, which is a monthly contribution scheme. We like to run events where people can have great vegan food and they can be helping us make money at the same time. The most difficult part of sanctuary life is the fact that um, it's all the time. So the sanctuary, of course, needs to be cared for at the very least from dawn to dusk every day of the year. There's, there's no day off, there's no day that you can just choose not to feed the animals that day. While Brad has very broad shoulders, you know, running a sanctuary 24-7 is a lot of pressure. I get to go home, you know, he's overseeing everything, every aspect of it. So yes, yeah, it would be a lot of pressure. It doesn't matter how hard it gets, you can never stop because the animals are here, they have to be fed, they have to be looked after. So everything just needs to keep going. So you don't need anything to motivate you because it's just a reality. I guess most of the rescues come from farms, factory farms, neglect cases. So many different stories on how some of the animals make their way here. Soon after the uh, sanctuary was started, um, we were contacted by someone who'd found a little baby chick walking through the streets of Wollongabba. Um, his name was Bubble and he turned out to be a rooster. When we got into the sanctuary though, he didn't want to come out of his coop, he didn't want to eat or drink anything. So we were confused about why that might be. We looked into his history and we found out that he had actually grown up with a baby duckling. Um, and of course, when we'd taken him to sanctuary, the duckling had stayed behind. So we uh, arranged for the duckling to come to be here with him. And um, he was immediately happy and um, they now live together. She uh, lives in her little pond overnight and he's got a stick that he sits on right above there. And um, the cutest thing about them, of course, is that they like to walk around and he talks to her in rooster and she talks to him in duck. It's um, very cute most of the time, except um, of course, if Bubble decides to go out for the day, because if he stays out too late, then she yells at him all night, which is a little bit noisy. On a whole, most of the animals that come into farm animal rescue get to live a beautiful long life. However, sometimes we do have animals that we can't help. They're just too ill. And that's really, really difficult. You sort of look at them being able to have this wonderful life ahead of them and we just can't help them. Anne-Marie was a dairy cow who um, was around seven years of age. In that time, of course, she will have had at least six babies because dairy cows are impregnated every year. Um, and then of course their babies are removed from them so that humans can have their dairy milk. When Anne-Marie arrived with us, she was in a very, very poor condition. She was uh, heavily emaciated. She had mastitis in three quarters of her udder, which is a very painful infection. Um, and she has a lot of skin damage and very poor skin quality. When Anne-Marie arrived, we realized that she was quite heavily pregnant. We were very concerned about her and we were very concerned about the baby. She carried the baby to term and gave birth to little baby Melissa, but Melissa was so very weak that she died when she was just four days old. Anne-Marie, as I say, was no stranger to loss. She'd experienced babies being taken away from her every year, but I guess that this was the first time that the baby had just died and she still had the carcass there because she would not let us go near that baby's carcass for two weeks. In this world, farm animals are subjected to some heinous crimes. So seeing that, being witness to that um, a lot is definitely depressing at times and angering at other times. I guess the work that we do here is sort of, you know, that's the best thing that I can be doing to try and help them out. Farm Animal Rescue, of course, has always been about education. It's about getting people to understand these animals and to understand the conditions in which they live. Um, and that still remains an incredibly important thing to do. So, of course, lots of people are affected in, in very many different ways, um, even to the point that it so fundamentally changes their life that they end up being one of our committee members like Joanne. 
I became a part of FAR after visiting the farm a few times and, and did several tours. When I came here the very first tour, I understood what actually happens to those animals and um, was extraordinarily ashamed and sad. The animals at Farm Animal Rescue are in such good hands with Brad at the helm. Living on the farm means that he is constantly in contact with what's happening with the animals, if there's emergency veterinary care, uh, if there are issues around uh, food and water supplies as there have been recently with the drought. To keep your costs as low as possible, of course, what you want to do is have as much of your own pasture as you possibly can. So when it stops raining, that becomes a bit of an issue because you have to start purchasing hay. This year, of course, has been particularly bad. There were then huge floods in far north Queensland, which means the hay from there is no longer available either. So it's actually been quite concerning this year because it's not just about the increasing costs, but it's also about the fact that we have, in some cases, not been able to get hay at all. Making sure we have the finances in place in case of drought or other environmental issues, but if something else out of our control was to happen, it could potentially be catastrophic. One of the most difficult things would be if something were to happen to Brad. I've seen other sanctuaries close because of this and rehoming the animals would be near impossible. The sense of loss and guilt and um, just, it would just be such a tragedy. I just don't think I could deal with that ever happening. Brad will always push through for the animals. They're his first priority. I think most people would probably have given up by now. It's, it's a hard, a very hard slog running a sanctuary. There's so much to think about and he's actually pulling it off. It would be foolhardy for any sanctuary to think that they were going to make a significant difference in the number of animals that can be saved from slaughter by running a sanctuary. There are millions and millions and millions and millions of animals that are tied up in this industry and sanctuaries can only do so much. There's only one way these animals are gonna be cared for and that's with you being part of it.